distinguished guests and members and friends of the vibrant Okshaba medical community. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the 2010 Medtronic Lecture, the third in a series of distinguished annual lectures aimed at encouraging exchange of ideas in biomedical engineering um, across the Atlantic. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to our speaker today, Professor Mark Grausnitz from the Georgia Institute of Technology, um, to um, Sir Roger Bannister, a great friend of uh, both sports and biomedical science in Oxford, and um, also to our um, two Medtronic representatives, um, Mr. Jeff Morris and um, Mr. David Dunham. This relationship was forged a number of years ago, and it's the only one of its kind between Medtronic and the Center of Excellence outside the United States. The particular aim of the collaboration, instigated by the founding director of the IBME, Fred Cornhill, and Dr. Steve Osterley, then Chief Technical Officer at Medtronic, was to promote graduate education in biomedical engineering, but with a particular emphasis on promoting biomedical engineering education amongst women, as well as to provide a forum for um, a, a better link between US and European universities. And what a great few years this has been, both in terms of education and in terms of research. In the last three years, under the leadership of Professor Alison Noble, we were awarded a Center for Doctoral Training in Healthcare Innovation, which allows us to fund some 15 graduate students to get translational education in biomedical engineering. Under the leadership of the current director of the institute, Professor Lionel Tarasenko, uh, we were awarded one of four nationwide centers of excellence in medical engineering funded by the Wellcome and the PSRC, specifically aimed at developing new technology for personalized healthcare. And finally, again under the leadership of the present director, we have been able to play a major part in um, the funding awarded to Oxford by the National Institute for Health Research for promoting the translation of technology into clinical trials. This triumvirate of high quality graduate education, high quality translational research within the laboratory and high quality translational research within the clinic very much forms the basis of the vision for the Institute over the next few years. And in that context, it gives me great pleasure to welcome someone as our speaker today who has made equally outstanding contributions to both um, education and research. Professor Mark Krausnitz um, graduated with, the, with a BS in chemistry from Stanford in 1988 and proceeded to um, uh, take a doctorate in chemical engineering in Bob Langer's laboratory at MIT in the general area of drug delivery. He joined the Georgia Institute of Technology in 1995 where he's currently a professor in both chemical and biomedical engineering, and is the director of the Center for Drug Design, Development, and Delivery, so four Ds rather than three. He has, in the area of education, um, um, supervised as primary supervisor more than 30 graduate students um, um, at a doctoral level, and has been awarded almost every um, graduate and undergraduate supervision distinction that Georgia Tech and external institutions have to offer. In the area of research, he has authored over 110 peer-reviewed publications. He is responsible for some 17 patents, and his international recognition started as early as 1992 with an outstanding work award in transdermal drug delivery by the Control Release Society, and continued uh, on a pretty much annual basis uh, for a Top 100 Young Innovator Award in 1999 and a Young Investigator Award by the Control Release Society in 2005. His work exemplifies where engineers can help in the battle for improved drug delivery. I first met him in 2007 where he was giving an invited lecture at the International Symposium for Therapeutic Ultrasound and I've never had the pleasure of meeting him personally, even though I was familiar with his work. But this is the one thing I remember from that meeting, and coming to think of it, is the one thing I remember from that year. And it didn't surprise me to actually um, um, uh, go away and find out that ultrasound, which is my own research area, was only one of the several areas in which he has made outstanding contributions. His work focuses on biophysical methods for drug delivery, at combining light, <coughs> sound, mechanical devices, as he will tell us himself. 
I have been asked to tell you a little bit about the program today, so following this short introduction, I will pass on to Mr. Jeff Morris, who will tell us a little bit about the significance of this relationship with Metronic, and will recognize the two Metronic scholars um, um, in the current MSc program. Following this, we shall have a lecture, followed by some 10 minutes of question, and then closing remarks by the current director of the Institute, Professor Lionel Tarasenko. Before passing on, though, I have been asked to give you two compulsory and one optional piece of advice. Please switch off your mobile phones. Secondly, should our lecturer literally set this lecture theatre on fire, I've been asked to point out that the fire exits are located there and there. And last but not least, given the provenance of our lecture, I'd like to emphasize that there will be absolutely no Pepsi products served today in first rooms reception. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Jeff Morris to tell us about the Metronic Lecture. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it really is a great honour and pleasure to, to be here on behalf of Metronic and particularly to present on behalf of the Metronic Foundation the certificates to the two Medtronic scholars. So with much do, uh, not that much do, I would like to invite Veronika Lutzak to come up and receive her certificate. Veronika. The ladies were very worried about whether I was going to ask them to say a lot because apparently last year they weren't prepared and had to say something. But I did think it would be very valuable if you could just share with everybody the project that you're going to be working on. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for the support um, that Metroid has provided and for this wonderful opportunity to say that I so at Oxford University. Uh, as part of our course, we are required to do a project, and my, I'll be studying um, my project at the Biomedical Ultrasonics and Biotherapy Lab. Um, my project is entitled Cell Sun Operation and I will be exposing the cells to ultrasound conditions with the hope of increasing drug delivery and um, efficiency. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to invite uh, Iona Safari up to receive her certificate. Disease 
um, are critical to the future uh, of how we manage increasing challenges within our healthcare system. Uh, my experience is predominantly within the UK. I, I'm the managing, essentially the managing director of the, the Medtronic organisation here. And I spend probably most of my time interacting with the chief executive officers uh, of Foundation Trust, uh, Department of Health bodies, and, and really what we're talking about there is how we can help manage the challenges and future challenges around increasing uh, healthcare costs and also the need to improve uh, their service delivery models. Um, currently, I, I really therefore work very much in what I would call the here and the now, and we're often being asked to do more with less. And that's the current mantra. However, there is a strong science base here in the UK, and this provides a strong platform for clinical research. And I believe we have the best science base in the world, thanks to institutions and facilities such as you have here in Oxford. It came to my attention that, that the UK is home to about 1% of the world's population. But I'm sure it's a fact that you're well aware of, but for me it was interesting to know that um, we, we collectively contribute as a country to the knowledge economy by undertaking about 5% of the world's science and research. So I really think as a country uh, we punch above our weight. Um, committing to the future of scientific research through scholarships such as these uh, I think is crucial if we continue to make significant contribution uh, to global scientific research. I also think that the, it, it's very important to support these scholars. And for me, it's about providing the opportunity for thinking and also very much visioning about the future and what, it, what will be possible to deliver in the future for the management of chronic disease. If you've ever had a chance to review Medtronic's mission, and, I, and if any of you picked up uh, one of our annual reports, you'll find, it, uh, you'll find the mission statement in there. Um, I'd like to review it if you get a chance, but the second one I think very much out of the six, uh, I think supports very uh, significantly what I'm saying here. And I'm just going to read it to you. Um, to direct our growth in the areas of biomedical engineering, where we display maximum strength and ability to gather people and facilities that tend to augment these areas, to continuously build on these areas through education and knowledge assimilation, to avoid participation in areas where we cannot make unique and worthy contributions. And these, these objectives or missions were written by Al Bark and the founder of Medtronic in 1960. So these are recent, uh, recent objectives or mission statements, and we very much believe and hold to them in the company, and I think that one encapsulates what we're talking about here this afternoon. I'd also like to, in a few minutes uh, left, to give you an example which I think and hope you feel is appropriate, and it sort of reflects a little bit on what we were talking about here in terms of the visioning and thinking about what's possible. Now, uh, disease of diabetes is one we've been talking about a few minutes ago, but it's clearly defined it find as a major chronic disease problem for our, our country, and one that's increasing in incidence significantly for many reasons. As a disease, we know that it's managed through the use currently of insulin, uh, because we know one's pancreas isn't working very well. But as a long-term condition, it's very much recognised that the impact of the disease is primarily on one's vasculature, uh, and this creates cons considerable problems, certainly as the disease progresses and later in life, if it's not managed properly. So what I'd like to really do is read you a text from a document which I think is relevant. Quote, its next use will be for delivering insulin-controlled doses to diabetic patients. Clinical studies for insulin therapy began early this fiscal year. Patients will be able to activate their own devices to release extra insulin at mealtimes. But in future applications, the device may be joined to a sensor that monitors blood glucose levels. Then, like the natural pancreas, the device will release insulin in response to changes in blood glucose levels. If you have a copy of the Medtronic annual report, you'll find some, I'm sure you'll find some similar and interesting things in there. But that quote came from the annual report uh, from 1983. And I wanted to just reflect on that fact that, you know, that was dreaming then about what might be in the future. So 27 years later, we now have a product uh, called the Veo Internet Pump, which is really on the first step to that automaticity that we're talking about. So I think it's about 
doing the work we're doing, the, the, the sort of scholarships we have here really do start to think about what we might be able to achieve. And I think that's what makes it so interesting uh, to be involved. Um, I think this is then a very good time for me to, to, to wrap up and to thank uh, uh, the Professor for delivering his uh, Medtronic lecture or Medtronic lecture. I think that his work and research fit very well with, with more, what I think my thoughts are about what is possible to deliver. To use new ways to deliver drugs via a biophysical mechanisms and his work with microneedles to inject into is exactly the area of innovation that we need to be thinking of for the future. Professor. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's, it's a pleasure not only to give this lecture and, and have an enthusiastic audience here, but it's also been a pleasure to be here for the last few days and interact with, with many colleagues here in the department at the University of Oxford and, and learn about all the wonderful things that are going on here. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Professor Lionel Tarasenko for his uh, kind uh, invitation to be here and, and the Institute as a whole for all of the the welcome that I've received. I'd also specifically like to thank Dr. Constantine Kusios, who has been my host and, and colleague as well. It's been a thoroughly enjoyable time. I want to especially thank you for the comments you made at the beginning, and in particular the reference to the 2007 lecture I gave. If I've done my math right, your son was born that year as well. So that's a particular honor that it was a, a memorable event for you. Uh, <laughs> This is Eva Williams has, has been a, a wonderful help as well to make sure all of our all of the logistics have gone smoothly and and finally let me thank Medtronic, uh, Mr. Jeff Morris and David Dunham for uh, for hosting this wonderful event for the support that you've given not only for the lecture but for the fellowships and for the the what it enables for the university and the field of biomedical engineering as a whole so thank you very much. With that let me turn to my lecture and I see I have to change the slides, which will take just one moment. So as has been mentioned, the topic that I'd like to speak to you about is biophysical methods of drug delivery. Probably you can envision what the drug delivery topic will refer to. What I think is something new in some cases in the field would be taking a more biophysical approach to solving problems in drug delivery. So we'll, we'll start with the, the challenge that is before us in the case of drug delivery and, and we, we will indeed move from cartoons to, to a bit more science but I actually do promise you not to, to burden you with equations or, or too many uh, detailed graphs and, and try to keep this at the conceptual level for the general audience that's here today. So I think that there are a number of tissue barriers that we need to overcome in drug delivery. There's medication that's outside the body, it needs to reach some target, and there are a whole host of different barriers in the way to have that drug make its way into the body and navigate its way to its target. So I think at its essence, the challenge of drug delivery is the challenge of selective delivery through various barriers, and by controlling that process, the drug goes where it needs to go. So if we ask the medicinal chemist how to achieve this, the medicinal chemist will usually answer that the, uh, the approach should be to change the drug. The drug is not lipophilic enough. The drug is too big. The drug doesn't bind to something preferentially. So let's make a drug that does it. And, and that's a, a, an excellent approach that works in many cases. I'll add then that the pharmacist would offer a different solution traditionally, and that would be to change the formulation. Okay, we've made the drug the best that we can, how can we package it? What sort, of, uh, what sort of solution should it be in? What sort of tablet should be in it encapsulated in? And, and so forth, and in that way manipulate its movement in the body. What I'd like to offer is an additional approach that, that we and others are taking, and that would be to change the barrier itself. Rather than accept the barriers that exist in the body as givens and figure out how to change the drug and formulation to work around them, Let's change the nature of the barrier itself so that we can go through a barrier that otherwise was in the way. So given, given this uh, approach, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'll, I'll show conceptually what I mean here. There are various barriers that exist in the body, and I'm showing two of them. One is, the, say, the cell membrane. Many drugs need to enter a cell in order to be effective. Another would be more at the tissue level and the 
Example that I've shown here is skin, where drug might need to go across the skin to enter the body. Usually we use a hypodermic needle to, to accomplish that, but perhaps there are some other ways. And what I'm going to discuss would be, for example, as you can see the, the arrow on your left, we might do something to the cell membrane, and I'll explain what that is shortly, but the membrane has, has clearly changed and has been made more permeable. Or in the case of the, the skin, we might also put a, a pathway into the skin. So at some level, what we're really doing is poking holes in things. But the key is to poke holes of the right size, in the right way, with the right lifetime for repair, and so forth. So in some cases, we might want to do a nanoscale disruption of the barrier. And sometimes it might be a microscale. And it, it depends on the nature of the barrier. Microscale is probably inappropriate for the cell membrane, but perhaps nanoscale is fine. Whereas in the case of a tissue barrier, you might go to the micron scale. So I'll, I'll touch on, as you see, seven different topics. Three of them, the first and the last two in some greater detail, and the others just, a, just some tidbits to, to give you a flavor for them, since there isn't time to go through them all in detail. But at the nanoscale, we'll look at ultrasonication of cells. And it's a tribute to, to a number of people here working in that field. Uh, I'll also talk about electroporation of epithelial barriers. And meganin, which is a peptide permeabilization of the skin. I'll then move to the micron scale, looking at thermal ablation of the skin as well as microdermabrasion of the skin, and then using microneedles both for skin delivery as well as delivery to the eye. So with, with that introduction, we'll start with the ultrasonication of cells. So as was briefly alluded to and with, with the, the, the first awardee today with the, with the scholarship, is that ultrasound can be used to help deliver things into cells. And, and here's a picture that illustrates that point. So this is microscopy showing uh, each of these is an individual cell that has been exposed to ultrasound while being incubated in different molecules that are all fluorescent. So in the absence of ultrasound, nothing enters cells. It's black. If you put calcine, which is a small uh, molecule, 600 or so molecular weight, it loads up into the cell very nicely after exposure to ultrasound under suitable conditions. We can look at bigger molecules, such as bovine serum albumin and some dextrans of different molecular weights. What you can see in each case is that the cell is loaded up. What you can see in, in the calcine case is the whole cell is. In the other cases, there's a black spot. And that corresponds to the nucleus. So this effect of ultrasound is affecting the cell membrane, making it more permeable, but is not affecting the nucleus. Calcine's small enough, it normally crosses the nuclear membrane. The others only enter the cytosol and are not able to enter the nucleus. So this, uh, this is maybe useful for something. We have tried to understand a little bit better what is happening to the cell so that we can, we can figure out how this might be exploited for medical purposes. So here is some, uh, some data, so one of the, 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 the graphs that I will show, showing the normalized intracellular concentration. So we have normalized relative to the extracellular concentration. So this is how close we are to equilibration with the external environment based on the time at which we have added the molecule into the solution. So as you can see, that if we add either calcine or BSA before sonication, and it's present while the cells are being exposed, in the case of calcine, we can almost equilibrate with the external medium. In the case of bovine serum albumin, not quite as close, but nonetheless extensive uptake. If we wait some time after sonication and then add the probe molecule in order to determine something about the lifetime of the, the hole that has been made in the cell, you can see there is a decay. And uh, within about two minutes, the bovine serum albumin no longer enters. There is still some calcine coming in. If you ate longer still, eventually the, the calcine can't enter either. So we have some indication that whatever effect we're having on the cell membrane is one that is long-lived but is transient. It will reverse. And indeed, the, the cells are all alive at the later time of analysis. Let's take a closer look now by microscopy to understand better what has happened to this cell. So what is shown here is scanning electron microscopy of a single cell. This is a, a prostate cancer cell. This is a control. So this is the normal appearance of the, the surface of this kind of cell. If we then sonicate a cell and, and look at it, a characteristic picture that we will see is shown here, where there is a region of the cell membrane here, as well as another spot there, that looks different. 
If we zoom in a bit closer, you can now see that spot that has been affected. And based on this picture, as well as uh, more information that we have as well, our interpretation is that the cell membrane shown all around has been removed. And what you are seeing here is cytoskeleton and cytosol in the interior of the cell. So a, a patch of the cell membrane has been removed, opening a door into the cell. And there is then a subsequent repair process that takes place, whereby over some minutes, that patch is resealed with new lipid to, to, to reseal the membrane. We can look by a different form of microscopy, now transmission electron microscopy, which makes a cross section through a cell. And this is the, the normal appearance of a cell. You can see the nucleus here, and this is the outer, outer membrane. If we look at a typical sonicated cell, we can see the following. There is a region here that looks different. And if we zoom in a bit closer, you can then see what that spot looks like. There's, again, a, a different view of a disruption or a hole that has been made in the cell membrane. And in fact, these vesicles that you see here, we believe, based again on this and, and other information that I won't have time to get into, are actually associated with the repair process, that intracellular vesicles are being trafficked to the site of injury and are then used to patch up the hole with the lipid of those vesicles. A final view that I'll, I'll show you to hopefully convince you that these holes that we see are associated with uptake of molecules and are also associated with cells that are alive. Of course, we, we fix these cells and image them, so we, we don't know the ultimate fate of the cells that I showed a moment ago because they got fixed before the repair had taken place. So now we look by confocal microscopy as, as well as a companion image in each case by light microscopy. So here is a, a cell, and then in this case, the cell membrane has been labeled with a red stain. So you can see by confocal microscopy, it provides a cross-sectional view, so you can see the outline of the cell. We then sonicate and fix a cell after two seconds and have a look. And you can see right here is the region where the membrane has been disrupted. And right here, again, it's the same cell. Right here is a region where you can also see the membrane has been disrupted. The red color is gone. The, the, the lipid that has been stained has, has been removed. And you can also see that during those two seconds of, of the sonication, two seconds afterwards, there is now a green marker inside. And this is the calcine. So this is a cell that has had its membrane disrupted and has taken up a large quantity of this marker compound, this model drug. If we then have a final example here where we wait five minutes and then look at a cell. And, and I have to give you a full, full disclosure, this is not the same cell. We, we fixed the cell. We found another cell here, but, but nonetheless representative of, of the population. What you can see now is that this cell looks intact, uh, has a red membrane all the way around, but it's green. So this is a cell where the membrane has resealed again. But obviously, the membrane had been open because the cell has taken up this molecule calcine at, at large concentration. So the, the conclusion that we reach from all of this is that we think that ultrasound mediated by cavitation breaks open the cell membrane, physically breaks open the cell membrane, allowing molecules to enter. And over some time scale of minutes, there's a resealing process that occurs. The cell survives from this and has now entrapped a large concentration of some molecule of, of interest to deliver. With that, let me move to our second topic, which is electroporation of epithelia. So we're going to change from using ultrasound now to using an electric field to induce a phenomenon called electroporation. And we are not going to work with individual cells, but we are going to move to an epithelium. So this is a, a model gastrointestinal epithelium that will be exposed to the electric field. Electroporation is known in the literature, and many of you probably have heard of it before, but it's a phenomenon where an electric field is applied that causes a reorganization of the lipids in the bilayer of a cell membrane, thereby allowing things notably such as DNA to enter into the cell. And the question that we were asking is, can we take this uh, largely laboratory technique that's, that's used in cell suspensions to, to put G D DNA into cells, can we now apply this in a tissue environment of an epithelium to deliver things into the epithelium? So here is some evidence that this idea has, has at least some merit. So what's shown here is for these CACO2 monolayers, so this is a laboratory model for, for the epithelium, 
in the unelectroporated sample, so our controls that have been incubated with either calcine or bovine serum albumin, we, we see nothing. If, however, we do everything exactly the same except we apply some electroporation pulses, then we see something quite different, and you can see here a, a completely green monolayer in both cases. To give you a sense of scale, each of the, the you can see better here, each of the, the black spots, that represents the nucleus of each individual cell. So we're seeing man, many cells on the order of 100 cells in this field of view. And as I'd mentioned before, the calcine not only enters the cell, but enters the nucleus as well, whereas electroporation, like the ultrasound, only affects the cell membrane, does not affect the nuclear membrane. So the bovine serum albumin enters the cell, but not the nucleus. But the observation of interest, nonetheless, is we can electroporate this planar monolayer of cells, uh, and, and that is um, that is an advance over the previous knowledge of electroporating cells in suspension. If we use this procedure now for an application potentially of interest, namely administration of DNA for transfection of this epithelium, we did a comparison between using lipofection, so a common lipid-based method of, of administering DNA to a cell, versus the electroporation. And along here, we have increased the DNA dose. And what you'll see is with the lipofection, we get some, some fine transfection. So I should note that, that this is expression of green fluorescent proteins. So this is not only delivery of the DNA into the cell, but ultimately expression of the green fluorescent protein. You can see that some cells express, but as you increase the DNA, we don't do any better. And that's because the, the ratio of the, the lipid to the DNA is critical. And we haven't increased the lipids. So we've, we've moved away from an optimal lipid to DNA ratio here to a suboptimal one. So you ask, well, why didn't you increase the lipid? Aren't you cheating? Well, the problem is if you increase the lipid too much, it becomes toxic to the cells. So there is, a, there is an upper limit to the amount of lipid you can have. And therefore, there's an upper limit to the DNA concentration. And, and that's it. You can't improve beyond that. In contrast with electroporation, it, it doesn't care what your DNA concentration is. It's a direct interaction between the electric field and the cell. And so as you can see, as we increase the DNA concentration, we can very much increase our ability to transfect these cells. A third topic that I'll mention in, in terms of uh, making nanometer scale disruptions in barriers is using a peptide called meganin. Now, meganin is a peptide that is known in nature, and uh, it, it is known in particular from a frog. And here's, here's the frog that it's known from. It's an antibacterial compound that is found on the frog's skin. And in fact, we, we have on our skin other antibacterial compounds that insert into bacterial cell membranes and, and form holes in them to, to protect us. In any case, we use the one that's from, from the frog in this study. And uh, the, the expected mechanism by which these work in cell membranes is shown here. They can form this helix where the interior has hydrophilic groups and then the hydrophobic elements of the peptide are facing outward and that can form a stable pore within a lipid bilayer. So those hydrophobic groups are sticking out, they interact nicely with the lipids of a cell membrane and then you have a hydrophilic region in the center through which molecules could potentially enter. And here is a, a, a picture of, of what some of those pores in the membrane perhaps look like. So the thought that we had was, might we use meganins that preferentially insert to bacterial membranes, which means preferentially insert into membranes that have a relatively high negative charge associated with them, use them to insert into the lipids that exist in the outer layer of skin, called the stratum corneum, but not have them insert preferentially into the living cells deeper. So it turns out that the lipids that are in the stratum corneum of skin, which is the barrier to things being absorbed into the body, carry a greater negative charge than the lipids you find in the living cells deeper down, in, for example, in the viable epidermis. So we could take advantage of this selectivity for bacterial cells and perhaps use it as a selectivity for the lipids of the stratum corneum and protect the living cells deeper below. So that's our hypothesis, and here's, here's some, some data concerning it. So we now have confocal microscopy of the skin, which is showing successive cross-sections through the skin, and this is done in, in human cadaver skin. The red fluorescence is associated with the meganin molecule itself, and the green fluorescence is some fluorescein that we're adding as a model drug. 
And what you can see is that if we look at the skin with uh, the addition of only fluorescein and nothing else, a little bit of fluorescein gets in and things get dark and, and uh, there's not much penetration of the fluorescein. If we then add a surfactant, I'm sorry, I, I left off a piece of information. In this first case, the meganin was also present. And so we see no meganin entering the skin and we do see a little fluorescein entering the skin. In the next picture, we have now added no meganin, but we have added this uh, surfactant. And the surfactant will make the skin more permeable, as, as you can see. So now we get a lot more green that is going deeper into the skin, so more drug is it, uh, model drug is administered. In the final scenario, we have administered both of these things. So the meganin as well as the surfactant, as well as the fluorescein. And what you can see is two things that I think are interesting. One is if we look at the green color of fluorescein, we now have the fluorescein going much deeper down into the skin. And I, I should note to give you a sense of scale that, that each of these approximately circular shapes is a, is a single cell within the skin. We are going into the stratum corneum, which is the first 10 microns or so, and we are going deeper down into the viable part of the epidermis below. If you look at the red color, and red exists where it's red as, where, as well as wherever it's yellow, green plus red makes yellow in, in this situation, you can see that the meganin has entered the stratum corneum quite nicely, but has not gone deeper down, only the fluorescein does. And so our interpretation of this is that the meganin, which has been developed in nature to insert into a single bilayer of a bacterium and sit there, is not able to penetrate deeply down into the stratum corneum. But when we add this surfactant, we enable the meganin to enter. And so the surfactant really does two things. It makes the skin permeable not only to the fluorescein, but also makes it permeable to the meganin, which gets in selectively to the stratum corneum and now makes the skin even more permeable by a synergistic interaction between the surfactant as well as the meganin itself. So I hope those served as some, some examples of more molecular scale, or in any case, nanometer scale, interactions that we might have to create holes and barriers that we would like to cross. In this case, in the form of lipid bilayers, whether they're lipid bilayers of the stratum corneum or, or lipid bilayers of cells in the earlier two examples. In other cases, I believe micron scale disruptions are of interest and are appropriate to, to do. Thermal ablation of the skin is the, the first example that I'll give. And I again show, show the skin and mention a, uh, now, now graphically what I had alluded to before, that we have this layer of stratum corneum which appears red with this staining. That is the barrier layer that we need to cross. Below that stained blue is the viable part of the epidermis. And finally, the very thick part of the skin is the dermis. The goal in drug delivery across the skin, what happens, for example, with a nicotine patch and so forth, is that the drug migrates its way across stratum corneum and, and the rest of epidermis and reaches a capillary bed in the superficial dermis where that drug is then absorbed into the systemic bloodstream. The problem is that although nicotine and a few other drugs are able to cross that stratum corneum and, and make their way, most drugs can't. So if we can make the stratum corneum more permeable, in most cases we have solved the problem. We're down into the permeable regions of the skin, can then access capillaries and achieve systemic delivery, which is often the goal. So conceptually what we want to do is take some small heaters and we will contact those heaters with the skin, pull them away and thermally ablate small holes. Now, a key to all of this, you may, you may be envisioning uh, spy movies and cigarettes being pressed against people in, in back rooms someplace for torture. Uh, indeed, this is perhaps related to that, but the key is these little heaters are quite hot, but the, the heating time is extremely short. Should be sub millisecond, we believe even as short as 10 to 100 microseconds is what is needed to make this work. And the reason that you want the heating time to be so short is you want to heat up the very surface of the skin and that will then, some will say, vaporize water and that, that ch phase change from liquid water to vapor will ablate, mechanically ablate a hole. I actually believe that probably what is responsible is, is a combustion, that there is a burning of the very surface of the skin, and that vaporization likewise will ablate a hole. But the pulse is so short that heat never goes deeper down. 
So the living cells below never experience an elevated temperature of significance, but you can ablate only the very surface of the skin in a controlled manner. So, so if you want to do it with a cigarette, you have to be very fast if you're going to achieve this. So here is some data that could guide us as to what kinds of temperatures would be appropriate. And in this case, we did a, a, a simpler kind of experiment where we used a, a more conventional heating source, not one of these very small ones, to generate these first data. And what I'm showing is the permeability on a log scale, so the permeability of skin, uh, human cadaver skin, shown versus temperature, and we have some brief exposures, longer, longer than they should be. Uh, these may be more like the cigarette. So what you can see is that as we increase the temperature, there is an increase in the skin's permeability. There is a dependence of time at these lower temperatures. Once we hit 300 degrees Celsius, the time dependence goes away, and we are able to get a thousand-fold increase in the permeability of the skin. So that gives us some indication as to the kind of temperature that we need to achieve. Well, we, we designed a system to, to do that, and this is now a, a microfabricated device that is uh, under electronic control and is, is able to give these very short pulses. The pulsing time here is between 10 and 100 microseconds long, and modeling tells us that the thermal gradient should not penetrate deeper down into the skin, and the evidence fr from this histological section is consistent with that, where over here you can see the stratum corneum, you can then see the epidermis, which is the, the rest of the, so the viable epidermis, which is more darkly stained, and then the dermis that is below. This is then the region that was treated, and this depression here is due to the contact of the heater with the skin and just mechanically moving it out of the way. So we haven't removed tissue this, this much. What is shown here is still the viable epidermis with the dark staining, but the stratum corneum is gone. And so we have found, and this is just one picture, but what we have found is that we can, in a reproducible way, selectively remove the stratum corneum with these very short pulses and keep the tissue below, apparently at least, unaffected. Another way that we might achieve the same kind of goal is not with a thermal ablation, but a purely mechanical microdermabrasion. And maybe some of you have heard of, maybe some of you have even had microdermabrasion done. It is, in essence, sandblasting of the skin in order to remove some, some upper layers of the skin, and it has desirable cosmetic effects. It will make you look uh, young and, and beautiful and so forth. So uh, we had different objectives, although maybe a side effect of this would make people not only get their drugs, but look younger and more beautiful, which certainly wouldn't hurt. Our goal was to use this kind of controlled sandblasting to selectively remove the stratum corneum again and not affect the deeper tissues. So conceptually, it's shown here. You can see uh, this, this handheld probe, which is applying these abrasive particles to the skin, and then it removes selectively stratum corneum. This is a, a clinical microdermabrasion device. The handpiece is shown here, and these are the, the particles that are, are used in, in clinical microdermabrasion. So we, we use the regular device, but we applied the microdermabrasion more aggressively than typically would be done. And what you can see in experiments that we've done both on, on monkeys in vivo, so these are macaques, as well as in pig skin in vitro, this is what it looks like before. You can see the viable epidermis and the stratum corneum, the viable epidermis again with the blue spots and the stratum corneum above. After the microdermabrasion, there are patches where the stratum corneum has been removed, but the viable epidermis remains. Likewise here, a, a larger patch where it's been removed and on, on the sides remains. We have taken a step beyond this where we put a mask on top of the skin. So that is a, a piece of, of, of polymer that has holes drilled into it. And now we can control exactly where the microderm abrasion occurs. Wherever the, the, the polymer film is, is protected. And the little particles can only go down wherever there are some holes. And so we are making, uh, mi we are microderm abrading regions that are about 100 microns in size, which is certainly co not cosmetically visible uh, and, and likewise is able to heal quickly, and therefore we, we feel that this is a useful regime. <coughs> Let me spend the last part of this talk addressing microneedle technology. In the first case, some solid microneedles that can be used in the case of the skin, and some hollow microneedles that can be used in the case of the eye. Our goal is once again to cross this stratum corneum barrier, and now using a needle structure. But un unlike uh, what is usually done with a large hypodermic needle that goes much further than in principle it needs to go, 
we only really need to go across the stratum corneum to cross the barrier. So in some cases, it would be appropriate to use a needle that's very small and then deposit the drug, or as you'll see in this case, vaccine, within the skin. So this is the, the concept. The first generation of microneedles that we made to address this concept are shown here. So here is an image of, of, you can see, 50 of them in a 5 by 10 array. Here is a close-up of some of those needles. These have been laser etched out of a sheet of stainless steel. So in fact, the technology is a very simple one to make these kinds of structures. Uh, we, we, can, we can make them for a, a, a few cents each. So, so the, the cost of the actual device is almost tr trivial. So making needles of this sort, you can then coat them. In this case, we've coated them with some riboflavin. Vitamin B is just a model compound, but we've coated them with other things as well. You can then take those coated needles. Here again is a, a coated one. This one is actually coated with influenza vaccine. You can stick them into the skin, and the coating will dissolve off. And here's a cross-section of skin. This was done in vitro. You can see the needle track. You can see the deposition of the, the fluorescent dye that we use within the skin. So this is the concept. You coat these very small needles, stick them in. The coating can dissolve off in a few minutes. You pull the needles out. They're essentially clean, uh, and then they are discarded. The second generation, which is where I'll show you some data, takes this a step further, and that is rather than having a strong metal shaft that has a coating around it which dissolves off, we want to get rid of that metal because we don't want to have any sharp waste, and we make the whole needle out of a water-soluble dissolving polymer. Our challenge is we got rid of the strong metal shaft, so we need to make the needle strong enough. So by choosing the right polymer, by making the right geometry, we can make them strong enough. What's shown here is an array with 100 of these microneedles. You can see the white backing. You can see the individual needles close up here. We've selectively encapsulated, in this case, a red dye within the needles where, where we want our active to be. It's not useful to have it in the backing. And this is, this is shown next to a, a US nickel. If you then stick these into the skin, they dissolve. So here you can see the needles initially. Here they are after a minute in the skin. Here they are after five minutes in the skin. So a relatively quick dissolution of the needle, a bolus delivery. You can then peel the patch off. All that's left is the backing. That's even made out of, out of polymer. In this case, did I say polyvinyl pyrrolidone? You, uh, you can throw that in, in the toilet. It will dissolve or otherwise get, get rid of it. This is some skin after the needles have been inserted and, and the red dye deposited. It, it, it's red dye. It's, it's not blood or anything. This is in vitro prep, and it's red dye that's been given. So using that approach, we have administered influenza vaccine to uh, mice, and the data are shown here. So this is the serum IgG, that is the antibody level in the mice measured at two weeks and four weeks after a single vaccination of a low dose of the vaccine. And we can compare the naive mice that receive nothing, the intramuscular injection, and the microneedle delivery of the same dose in both of those cases, and what you can see is after two weeks, the microneedle lags a little bit. And by four weeks, uh, the microneedle and the intramuscular injection are the same. If in addition to just measuring the virus-specific antibodies, we measure hemagglutination inhibition. And this is when, when you go to the regulatory authorities to get approval for your vaccine, this is the, the parameter that they will be interested to see. And what you can see here is, note it's on a log scale, in the case of the microneedle and the intramuscular at both two and four weeks, those measures are essentially the same as each other. We then infect the animals, expose them to a lethal dose of influenza virus, and we measure survival. What is shown here is in both of the vaccinated groups, there is 100% survival. In the naive animals, within a week, they have succumbed to the disease. If we, in parallel, measure the weight of these animals, so they didn't die, but were they ill, of course, the naives had, had lost weight. But in the case of the vaccinated animals, in both cases, there was essentially full protection, no significant loss in weight. So our conclusion from these data so far is that the microneedle and the intramuscular injection are, are about the same as each other. But of course, an advantage is that these microneedles can, can be used in, a, I didn't mention, but in a painless manner, generate no sharp waste. We think could potentially even be self-administered, which would be convenient for people in the seasonal flu situation or could actually be quite important in a pandemic situation where there's very rapid distribution of vaccine needed. 
But if we uh, follow just a bit more, we see some interesting additional advantages, namely immunologic advantages of the microneedle route of administration. And that is shown in particular here. So after we challenged the animals with the live flu virus, we then looked four days later to see how much flu virus was still living, remaining, replicating within the lung. And what you can see on a log scale here is that the, the naive animals that, that were infected but had not been vaccinated, there is a very high viral load, as you would expect these animals a few days later had died. We can then look at the intramuscular vaccinated. Indeed, things, uh, things went well. There's a three order of magnitude reduction in the viral load in the lung. But if we then look at the animals with the microneedles, there's another three order of magnitude reduction. So a six order of magnitude reduction in all. And so what we have found is that by administering the vaccine using the microneedle into the skin, and I think into the skin is really the, the key feature here as opposed to a magical feature of microneedles, we're able to target different immune cells that are in the skin as opposed to in the muscle. And we therefore have the antigen processed in a different way that is able to provide this better protection. Indeed, all the animals survive, but we can see that because the lung was more quickly and efficiently cleared of virus, that there was a better protection here. Uh, and so perhaps if a, if a stronger dose had been applied, the, it still would have been protected in the case of the microneedles. In addition, when transmission might occur from one person to another, coughing virus out, less virus should come out in this scenario than in the case where there's more virus in the lung, so there might also be reduced transmission. These hypotheses remain to be tested. A last thing that I'll show having to do with the microneedle has to do with thermal stability. It's uh, often of interest, especially in developing countries, but otherwise, to avoid the need for refrigerated storage. What I'm showing here is an in vitro measure of antigenicity, so it, it's the hemagglutination potency, so that is the, uh, th this, this in vitro measure of the activity of the vaccine, shown as a function of time in the case of both microneedle and liquid vaccine stored at four degrees. So this is the refrigerated case. And what you can see is the liquid vaccine is very stable, as you would expect. In the case of the microneedle, we do have some loss. You can see about a one-third loss in the activity of the vaccine during the encapsulation process, or the process of just making the microneedles and putting the vaccine inside. If we then watch what happens afterwards, then everything remains stable during the storage period out to three months. The parallel experiment was done, except the storage was done at 45 degrees for three months. In this case, the liquid vaccine almost immediately loses its activity, which is not surprising. The, uh, the most interesting feature here is that with the microneedle, there was this more rapid loss, but then everything remained constant. So uh, this suggested to us that storage of the vaccine in a dry state within this polymer microneedle matrix was able to stabilize the vaccine for extended storage for extended, uh, extended period of time at, at a, in this case, a very high temperature. So again, more work needs to be done, but we think that the microneedle, because it is itself in a solid state format, can help with the stability of the vaccine during storage. So the last topic that I would like to address is using a different kind of microneedle for delivery to the eye. And our approach, I, I'll need to explain a bit more, is suprachoroidal delivery for retinochoroidal targeting. So I have a couple of terms to define for some of you. Suprachoroidal delivery means delivery to a space that exists between the choroid and the sclera. So I've taken a close-up view here. The very outer layer of so the cornea of the eye is here, the clear part, and then the white of the eye is the sclera. Immediately below the sclera is the choroid, which is a largely vascular tissue. And beneath that is the retina, which of course is, is the nervous tissue that sees, and, and the vitreous is in the very interior, which is a, a hydrogel in essence. Typically when, an injection, typically when drug is administered to the eye, and I should preface or add to that to the back of the eye, so eye drops don't reach the back of the eye to treat things like macular degeneration. Typically then a needle, hypodermic needle, is inserted into the vitreous and an injection is made here. The drug can then diffuse radially out and reach the choroid and the retina where its site of action is to treat, for example, macular degeneration and, and most other diseases of the back of the eye are in that region. 
Our approach is to target the space between the sclera and the choroid, which is a potential space. It easily separates, for example, in various disease states where there might be fluid accumulation in the eye. The fluid will accumulate in that space. It will, it will expand. The fluid will eventually be resorbed, and, and it will come back without any, any uh, negative consequences from that. So our idea is that we can stick a very small hollow microneedle, inject fluid into that space, remove the needle, and then we can get flow within that space, now targeting exactly the region we want. We don't have to administer things into the middle of the eye. We can target them to this interface exactly where the therapy is needed. So this is our goal. Let's, let's see how we did. We have, in addition to the solid microneedles I showed before, we have some hollow microneedles, and there's a, a variety of different designs of them shown here. Let me show you the device that we made for this particular purpose where, and, and this, is, this is strictly a research device at this point, uh, maybe Medtronic will make a better one for actual clinical use at some point. Here you can see the syringe, some tubing, and here's the business end with a microneedle at the very tip. Let's zoom in. So now you can see a little better the hand piece with the tip and zoom in further. It's a little blurry now, but you can see the, the tip protruding out. And finally, if we zoom in all the way, here is that microneedle sticking out, shown next to a conventional 30-gauge needle that might be used for uh, injection into the eye. So you can see the length of the needle is comparable to the width of the hypodermic needle. This needle is, is uh, I believe it's, it's uh, about 500 microns long. And now comes the movie. So here, what, we, what I'm going to show you a movie of is this is a rabbit eye. So this is the whole globe. The piece that's sticking out here is the optic nerve. And it's being held in place in a, in a little cup, and it's being illuminated so you can see it. Here is the hand piece that I showed you before. And at the very end, where you can't see it, is that microneedle sticking out. So the, the needle is not this wide. The microneedle is that little piece sticking out below the wider hand piece being pressed against the eye. So let me start the movie now. And what's going to happen is that we are injecting some, some black dye into the eye. So the injection is about to start. Here it starts. You can see now the, the spread that's occurring. It's starting to spread, uh, of course, to the sides. The cornea here is in the front, the optic nerve in the back. Now it's starting to spread toward the back. This is being shown in real time. So the whole injection is taking just a few seconds. And uh, now you can see we've, we've reached the optic nerve. In fact, even a little will start to travel up the optic nerve if, if you look carefully at the, the very end. Now the cameraman went crazy, and uh, we, can, we can go to the next picture. So after doing something like that, you may wonder, you know, where did that dye go? And, and, and did it go into that suprachoroidal space? So here's a, a cross-section through an eye after an injection of that type. This is the, the thickness of the sclerochoroid retina here. This is the injection site. We have some, some on the surface. But most went into this space here. And you can see, although the injection was made close to the anterior segment, it was able to flow all the way back, again, in a matter of seconds, all the way around the eye within that suprachoroidal space. A little closer view to hopefully convince you of that. Here's an across section showing the sclera, the choroid, the retinal pigment epithelium, which is the interface with the, with the choroid and the retina, and then the retina shown here. We've injected carbon black particles, so you can see all the little black particles that are sitting here at that interface between the sclera and the choroid. So based on these and other pictures, we think we are targeting that suprachoroidal space. If we look at the longevity of something administered into that space, it might be nice for things to stay there. In particular, if you could administer some particles for controlled release over a long time, you may not want to see the doctor every day and have a suprachoroidal injection on a, on a regular basis. So if you could do it infrequently, that would be attractive. So here is a 500 nanometer, some just latex particles that we injected that were fluorescent. And then we can measure over a different time. And we went out to about a month. And what you can see is, well, that the one hour measurement, everything hadn't yet stabilized in, in the field of view where we were making the, the measurement. But then in, in the same animal, so this is a non-invasive measurement of fluorescence, you can see that for a month's time period, the particles stayed put. The particles weren't eliminated. We've even followed a few animals out to two months. Particles don't move. So you can now envision something where you have a biodegradable particle loaded with drug. You can put it into the suprachoroidal space and have it sit there, apparently indefinitely, 
But now the kinetics can be determined by the particle you've designed so that it will slowly degrade release drug and, and ultimately be eliminated because of particle degradation. Here's a corresponding picture of an animal one month after the, uh, the supercoroidal injection, and you can see all the particles sitting in that supercoroidal space still one month later. So that has brought us to the end of the presentation, and I'll just uh, try to, to recap that oftentimes it's of interest to change the drug or the formulation, as is conventionally done, but I think there are many opportunities to change the barrier itself and use that in conjunction with these other methods. And that might be at the nanoscale, we discussed ultrasound electroporation and meganins. Might also be at the micron scale, where we looked at thermal ablation, microdermabrasion, and two different kinds of microneedle scenarios. So with that, I'll end and, and thank the people who have, have enabled this research to take place, both uh, current and, and past lab members, collaborators, funding sources, and, and just a, a comment that I do have some financial interest in the ultimate outcome of this research. Thank you very much, Mark. It's my pleasure and privilege to uh, propose a vote of thanks for our Medtronic lecturer this year. When, when we look for a Medtronic lecturer, um, we have two criteria, uh, or two main criteria. First of all, we look for uh, an international scholar of repute from the US. Uh, we knew we got that in, in Professor Prasnit from uh, Constantine's assessment of the field and from Professor Prasnit's CV. And secondly, we hope that we will be able to have somebody who's a good communicator. I'm sure you'll agree with me that uh, Professor Pro Prasnitz is indeed a wonderful communicator. He's taken us through a wonderful seven-part tour of how to disrupt barriers to drug delivery. Um, as an electrical engineer, I was with you um, pretty well in terms of electric fields and ultrasound fields at first. Got a bit lost. Uh, maybe in the permeability and frog bacteria and so on. But I really appreciated um, your technique for the last four, gradually increasing the pain level, um, starting <laughs> with um, ablation, then going to abrasion, and finally microneedles, and finally in the pièce de résistance, microneedles to the eye. And I did see one or two people squirming in their seats. <laughs> um, but that is a wonderful way to hold an obvious attention. Uh, attention is to increase the level of pain towards the end. <laughs> and absolutely nobody, despite the warmth of the lecture theatre, was nodding off as you were concluding your lecture. So thank you, Professor Prydnitz, for holding our attention, for demonstrating the breadth and depth of your scholarship, and for being a wonderful uh, 2010 Medtronic lecture. Thank you very much.